Hello and welcome to the Supportive Care Services Virtual Lunch and Learn series. We've created a series of Lunch and Learn videos to help you be successful when navigating your cancer journey. Our Supportive Care Services Department is here to help you get actively involved in your healing process. For more information about the Supportive Care Services Department, please email socialwork at ironwoodcrc.com. Hello, welcome everyone. I am Dr. Heidi Rula. I am the Integrative Oncologist here at Ironwood uh, and the Medical Director of Supportive Care Services. Today we are doing our Lunch and Learn series on lifestyle prescription for bone health in the cancer survivor. Uh, now bone health is certainly a topic um, that I work with so many of our patients on. You know, cancer patients um, are at high risk um, for osteoporosis and issues with kind of bone loss. Um, and so I, many, um, you know, ask about what they can do to be able to um, have an impact um, on improving their bone health after they complete cancer treatment. So really that's what uh, this focus of today's topic is going to be about, you know, some of these lifestyle interventions an individual can take um, above and beyond any kind of pharmaceutical approaches to bone health that are being offered. Um, so. Let's get started um, on our talk. Um, so osteoporosis is a disease of the bone, which causes you know, loss of bone minerals, as well as kind of a disruption of the kind of architecture or kind of the scaffolding that makes up our bone. So the scaffolding is really what the bone minerals kind of attach to. So it can either be kind of just loss of that bone mineral or a disruption of the scaffolding that uh, weakens the bone and puts it at an increased risk for fracture. In uh, more advanced stages of this bone loss or osteoporosis, even just a simple fall from a standing position or even a hard cough or sneeze could lead to a fracture. You know, certainly, um, you know, in my mother's case, she had some advanced osteoporosis and she had some pneumonia. She was coughing a lot. And one day uh, that hard cough led to some severe back pain uh, that ended up being diagnosed as a compression fracture of her spine, um, which was a result of, of her kind of very weakened um, kind of bone architecture and, and bone mineralization. So again, it can have a very significant impact on health. Um, some of the areas where that are most at risk for experiencing fracture are going to be hips, spine, and your wrist. Um, you know, others areas of, of uh, or other parts of your body can be um, at risk for these fractures, but these are probably the uh, the fractures that are most common in somebody with osteoporosis. You know, when we think about bone, a lot of times people think of bone as being static, that, you know, it just doesn't change uh, with time, but that's really not the case. Your bone is something that is constantly uh, being remodeled. Um, and that's due to kind of these two different cells. You have osteoclasts, um, which are cells that are breaking down the bone. We need these because our bone actually serves as a source for calcium for our bloodstream so that calcium can be delivered to all of our cells as it needs it for its bodily function. Um, and then we have osteoblasts, which is building up um, kind of bone. And so these two cells should be kind of working in balance uh, to kind of maintain kind of a stable kind of bone density. But when kind of the breakdown, you know, starts to kind of outpace the building, you know, that's where we see loss of uh, bone mineralization. And so again, as we age, we start to see that. And, you know, we have a picture here kind of, of our hip bone. You know, on the left, you can see a healthy bone. And you can kind of see kind of this webbing kind of type structure of the bone, which is kind of that scaffolding. The white is the mineralization. So that's where kind of our, all our calcium and mineral is being kind of um, attached to that structure. And it looks like it has, you know, a pretty kind of homogeneous kind of um, um, kind of uh, kind of architecture to it. You can see the the bone, the hip bone on the right, you know, we have all these almost seems like a moth is kind of, you know, eaten out some of the center, right? So you have loss of kind of that architecture. So that nice webbing, you know, doesn't have kind of that nice um, kind of uh, um, kind of uh, pattern to it. Um, and there's a lot of uh, loss of kind of that, that white uh, mineralization to the bone. So this osteoporotic bone on the right, you can see how it could be much more at risk for a fracture from any type of trauma than this healthy bone um, on the left. 
And so osteoporosis is truly kind of a public health concern. We have over 10 million Americans who have been diagnosed with osteoporosis and 34 million Americans who have been diagnosed with kind of that precursor to osteoporosis, something we call osteopenia. So that's, you know, loss of kind of normal amount of bone density, but not to the degree yet um, of osteoporosis. After the age of 50, one in two women will experience a fracture related to osteoporosis. And one out of four men after the age of 50 will experience a fracture. So this is really a major health concern um, that affects so many um, adults as they go you know, into aging. So osteoporosis is not just a concern because obviously fractures are painful, but above and beyond just the kind of the, the pain associated with the kind of acute fracture, we know that these fractures can lead to chronic disability and even increase an individual's risk of dying. Hip fractures really are the most fatal. So we see that you know the risk of death within the first year is quite high and it remains elevated for 10 years after um, a, a person experiences that fracture. Spinal fractures are also something that increases a risk, the risk of somebody dying from you know, the consequence of that fracture. Uh, and that risk uh, can be elevated for about five years. But really, you know, in spinal fractures, the thing we think about most is just really kind of that chronic disability, that chronic pain. When somebody experiences a, a spinal fracture, well, that's where we see kind of some of that loss of height as well as you start to see kind of more of like a curving of the spine, right? When people kind of have that humped over effect, you know, when you see some collapse of some of these, um, of your spinal column, that changes kind of that normal architecture of your, of your spinal column. And so you now start to see maybe a bending, a curve to that, and usually kind of a, a forward type of bend, um, you know, related to these fractures. Uh, again, so this is something that, you know, can have some very long-term health consequence and it really can uh, decrease somebody's quality of life with aging. So bone mass is something that, you know, we are really kind of working on, um, you know, in kind of our youth. Um, 90 percent of our bone mass is achieved you know in women by the time they're 18 and in men by the time they're 20 and it's really kind of that first 30 years of life where we're really working on kind of achieving you know peak bone mass because it's really kind of where you are with that peak bone mass that if you start out with a really good bone mass, if you lose a little over time, you still can um, kind of maintain, um, you know, normal bone density with aging. But if you already start out with a decreased, you know, bone density, um, kind of in your young years, your chance that you're going to end up with osteoporosis kind of earlier on, um, kind of uh, in your life, you know, is is quite significant. So really focusing on kind of, you know, um, a healthy body, healthy lifestyle in those first 30 years of life is probably going to have the biggest impact on your lifetime bone uh, mineral content. We know that after the age of 30, women are going to lose about 0.3 to 0.5 percent of their bone density, um, you know, over over you know that year. So in about a decade, losing about three to five percent of bone mass, which e with each decade of life that they go through. Um, you know, hormones are really a big driver of bone mass. You know, for women, it's really estrogen that plays you know that big role. Um, so we see that you know once estrogen is um, you know, is, is dropped at our levels to decline. Um, that is really when, you know, we see a sudden kind of drop in bone mineralization. So after a woman goes into menopause, about 20% of her bone mass uh, will be lost over a five to seven year time frame. Once you kind of are through that five to seven years, that loss starts to kind of decrease and stabilize a little bit and then, you know, it slows down. But that five to seven years uh, after menopause, whether that be a natural menopause you go into, a surgical menopause, you get put in medical menopause, uh, which happens to a lot of cancer patients, whether it be chemotherapy or some of the medications 
that are put in, you know, that's really kind of in that five to seven years um, where, you know, you're seeing your bones really change. Um, you know, men also um, have an influence of hormones. Testosterone is really the major influencer for, from a hormonal standpoint for them. Um, so a decline in testosterone levels occurs with aging. So as a man ages, um, we see some loss of bone density. And then obviously a lot of, you know, cancer therapies um, for kind of hormone dependent cancers like in, in prostate cancer. Um, when you know testosterone levels are blocked, um, that also can can lead to some sudden changes in bone density. So, who's at risk for osteoporosis? You know, it really kind of goes into these risks um, that we call non-modifiable, so things we can't really change, like our gender. You know, women have a much higher uh, risk for developing osteoporosis with age than men, six to eight times greater than men, um, just as aging. So after the age of 50, our risk is much higher than when we were younger of having a diagnosis of osteoporosis. Our ancestry plays a role, so European and Asian ancestry puts you at higher risk. Uh, for osteoporosis, being of really kind of that small bone frame, um, that's something um, that is a risk factor. And as I said, being postmenopausal, um, kind of as kind of the nor part of the normal life cycle is to go into menopause, but it is really you know that time frame um, where uh, an individual um, you know is much more at risk for uh, losing bone mineralization. So what are the things that we can have an impact on in terms of our risk for osteoporosis? Well, certainly smoking is something that, uh, that impacts uh, bone health. Um, so you have a 15% uh, greater risk uh, of have developing a bone fracture if you're a smoker. Uh, people who are sedentary. So a lot of us, you know, have desk jobs. And if you don't really kind of make an effort to kind of get some physical exercise, um, you know, throughout your day, um, that puts you at risk for losing, um, you know, bone density, eating disorders. So people with anorexia, bulimia, even chronic dieters, people who are all on some type of diet, uh, again, that can put, um, you know, the body kind of at risk for not getting the bone nutrients it needs to kind of achieve, you know, good bone density. Um, so that certainly is a risk factor. Um, people who are indoors all the time, you know, um, you know, probably related to our vitamin D. Vitamin D is something we make when we're outdoors. And so if you're indoors all the time, you know, that can be a risk. Um, and then many different medications can play a role in bone density. You know, for, you know, our cancer patients, you know, any of these kind of hormone kind of type blockers, you know, like, like for men, Lupron, for women, these um, aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole and nitrozole, uh, diuretics, so these water pills, you know, thyroid hormone use, uh, seizure medications, and one that's very common are these um, acid blockers or proton pump inhibitors. So the miprazoles or Prilosex and Prevacids and those type of medications are associated with higher risk of fracture. And also they're associated with lower magnesium levels. So, you know, maybe it has something to do with magnesium absorption, but these medications, um, you know, put an individual at risk for osteoporosis. Um, also different chronic diseases, you know, kidney, liver disease, diabetes, some of these uh, digestive diseases like celiac disease and Crohn's disease, um, you know, put an individual at increased risk um, for uh, osteoporosis. Um, so when we think about, you know, cancer treatments, um, you know, what are the things that um, are going on that kind of affect bone health? Well, we talked about these aromatase inhibitors, which are very commonly um, prescribed for breast cancer survivors in the first five to 10 years after um, treatment or diagnosis. Um, these uh, medications are associated with an accelerated kind of bone loss. Um, you know, these the, for men, um, androgen deprivation therapies like we use for prostate cancer, um, you know, put a, a, a man at risk for osteoporosis. Um, and chemotherapy. Um, any cancer patients have gone undergone chemotherapy. Uh, I mean, a lot of times these chemotherapies will put a woman into menopause. Um, you know, in that early menopause that we talked about, those hormones are, you know, play a role in kind of bone density. So uh, when, especially when, it go, when we, uh, women experience this kind of an early menopause, um, that can really put her at risk for kind of long-term kind of bone loss. 
Uh, the use of steroids are very common in a lot of different uh, cancer regimens and chemotherapy regimens. Uh, steroids are definitely associated with bone loss. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, for, can for especially for things like breast cancer and other uh, gynecological cancers, and women might have her ovaries removed or, again, be put into um, a menopause with different medications uh, that would put her at risk. And stem cell transplant patients are at risk um, for bone loss. So, you know, if you've undergone one of these type of cancer treatments, you know, you're going to be in that high-risk category. And so really kind of focusing on bone health um, is very important um, kind of moving forward uh, for, um, for healthy aging. So how do we diagnose this condition of osteoporosis? Well, really the gold standard is something we call the DEXA scan. The dual energy x-ray absorptometry has the full name, but DEXA is probably you know the term that's gonna be thrown around uh, when they talk to you about these scans. Uh, the image here is you know what uh, what that scan looks like. It's a very you know it's a, a simple um, scanner bed um, with kind of an arm over that's kind of measuring bone density. Nothing touches you. You're not in an enclosed tube, so um, it's not a painful test in any way. It's a very simple test uh, to have done. Um, so. When we look at that, we generally kind of use the T-score, which is one of the results that we um, achieve from this bone density test um, to uh, you know, tell us kind of the state of your bone mineralization. Now remember, this test me measures bone mineralization. We talked a little bit about the architecture, right? That scaffolding of the bone, it really doesn't you know, assess kind of the health of that scaffolding, but it does tell us how much mineral is applied to that scaffolding. Um, so we, can, we look at generally three main areas. The, this uh, this uh, DEXA will tell us, you know, the um, the density of your your hip bone, um, and as well as kind of the little bridge between the ball and the shaft of the hip, what we call the femoral neck. Um, so you generally get a total hip score, you'll get a femoral neck score, you'll get a spine score, and you'll get usually a, a wrist score. Not always, um, you know, wrist or forearm score, but um, but when we look at that, we then we're going to look at those T scores, right? And so those T scores, um, you know, really the way you interpret that is a score of a minus 1.0 or higher is normal. Um, anything between a one point minus 1.1 and a minus 2.4, um, you know, falls into that kind of early bone loss. So you're starting to no longer have normal bone minerals, but um, but it's not yet to the degree of osteoporosis. And then we make that diagnosis of osteoporosis with a score of minus 2.5 or lower. So that is when um, you know a diagnosis is made. If you have that score of minus 2.5, now remember this T score is kind of comparing you to kind of a 25 to 35 year old, you know, um, of your same sex. Um, so that's why some of these negative numbers. Um, again, especially as we age, we're gonna, we're gonna have a lower bone density than a 25 or 30 year old when we're 50. Um, but uh, but the T score is the general interpretation uh, for this test. So when do we screen? You know, generally it's recommended for women after the you know the age of 65. Men, there's really kind of not a standard recommendation. Some, some um, you know, uh, institutions are recommending men to be screened over 70, but that's not a universal recommendation. And then, you know, really it's, you know, if you have, uh, if you're at high risk, you know, it really can be measured anytime, um, you know, especially for, um, you know, breast cancer patients who are going on these medications called aromatase inhibitors, we usually are going to have a bone density uh, baseline test, uh, you know, before you get started on them or just, you know, as soon as you get started on them. And then usually a follow up is going to be done, you know, in one to two years after kind of going on those medications. Um, usually, um, you know, if you're diagnosed with osteoporosis or even osteopenia, um, you know, you're going to start to get a, have a more regular uh, schedule of scans so every one to two years. If your bone density is normal, a lot of, a lot of times, um, you know, on these scans, you know, as long as you're not in a really high risk um, group, you know, you might wait five years or so to kind of scan again just to see what's happening with your bones. But if you're already being identified as having kind of some bone loss, uh, then you're going to go into a more frequent so kind of one to two year scanning schedule. So what are the symptoms? Uh, a lot of patients say, oh, you know, my hip's been hurting. Is that osteoporosis? 
Really, osteoporosis is what we can consider to be a silent disease. Early stages of osteoporosis have absolutely no symptoms. It's not until that bone loss becomes much more advanced do you start to experience any kind of symptoms. So we talked about loss of height, you know, as you age. So that's a sign that maybe some of your um, your uh, spinal, uh, your vertebra, your spinal columns are starting to collapse a little bit. Uh, we're talking about kind of, again, kind of a stooping kind of of your, um, of your uh, back, you know, where you kind of get a little hunched over. That can, again, be part of the collapse of some of these vertebra in your back or just back pain, um, you know, from, a, again, sometimes it can just be a small collapse of these vertebra uh, that can lead to some discomfort. A lot of times those collapse can occur and sometimes uh, patients are unaware that that's occurring and they're starting to then start to see kind of a, a forward kind of um, a stoop uh, to their spine. So if somebody has osteoporosis, you know, what is the approach? So generally, we're going to look at lifestyle and medications. Those are kind of the two categories of how you help someone. Today's talk, we're really, you know, focusing on lifestyle. So healthy diet, exercise, and then really looking at, you know, trying to prevent falls. Um, so if someone, um, you know, has an advanced osteoporosis, you know, making sure the home is safe, you know, having grab bars, you know, in the shower, making sure you don't have any rugs that, you know, kind of trip and fall. Um, so just, again, making sure you have a safe environment, you know, that way. Um, but we're really going to kind of talk mainly about kind of nutrition and exercise is kind of some of our ways to kind of address um, osteoporosis from a lifestyle intervention. So when we talk about exercise, you know, it's really the earlier you start exercising your life, the greater impact it's going to have. We talked about how, um, you know, how you kind of work on obtaining kind of peak bone density. So an active child, an active early adult is going to work on kind of building that peak uh, bone density uh, that will then kind of be that starting point for kind of loss to occur. So the earlier you exercise, uh, the you know, the greater impact that exercise is going to have on your bones. Um, you know, the type of exercise um, that really kind of helps um, um, with, uh, with kind of improving bone density and kind of stabilizing bone loss is going to be weight-bearing type exercise. So if somebody is healthy and just in their very early stages of bone loss, um, they might look at high impact exercises as having, you know, the biggest um, impact on bone density. Um, so dancing, hiking, jogging, jump rope, uh, you know, stair climbing, playing tennis, you know, again, um, somebody who doesn't have any significant bone loss can really um, kind of participate in some of these more high impact uh, exercises that can have a good uh, result for bone mineralization. If you already have some significant osteoporosis, you know, really kind of focusing more on low impact exercises. So working on an elliptical, doing a stair stepper, Fast walking, either outside or on a treadmill, um, can be good ways uh, to influence a kind of bone density. Putting some of that stressors on the bone to tell your bone to kind of lay down, you know, stronger uh, kind of bone mineral um, to keep that bone being able to um, uh, withstand any of the forces that your regular activities um, are providing. And then um, strength training. So weights you know that can be free weights you know working on uh you know machines in the gym uh, elastic bands and that can even just be using your own body's resistance you know so again you know doing things like a plank doing things like squats all of those things you know can be um helpful on um on influencing bone mineralization and how often I mean, the good news is that you don't have to do much, you know, three times a week for 12 to 20 minutes. That's really not, you know, a big effort in terms of kind of weekly, um, weekly uh, time that you spend on this. But, um, but it is important because it can have an impact throughout any point in your life on, on helping with, uh, with bone density. The other thing that sometimes uh, people could consider is using a weighted vest. Probably again, if you have advanced osteoporosis, I wouldn't recommend this. But um, again, some early um, earlier stages of osteoporosis. You know, there have been some studies showing that if you wear one of these vests, um, that you can see um, a stabilization of bone density, um, you know, increased strength. So we see a number of health markers improve with wearing these weighted vests. 
Um, how this works is generally you're going to put about four to ten percent of your body weight kind of in this vest. So if you're a 150 pound individual, you know, you're going to either do so do use somewhere between six to 15 pounds in this vest. The vest weighs about a pound itself and there's different weights that you can add as you build up, um, you know, uh, with uh, with higher and higher weights. And so usually, you know, we're going to, you know, start out with, the, with you know, maybe up to three pounds and kind of, you know, do that for a few weeks, make sure you're comfortable, make sure it's not causing any discomfort, and then gradually kind of add a pound or two, you know, getting up, you know, to the maximum of that 10%. And we really don't want you to go above and beyond that, um, you know, and it shows that you need to do it for at least an hour, three times a week to really get the benefit of wearing this vest. So anyway, that's something for some individuals to consider is wearing this vest while they're out doing their exercises or just some of their daily activities. So kind of focusing then on nutrition, um, you know, calcium and vitamin D are generally the ones that most people think of when they think of what they need to do for their bones. But there's really some growing evidence that there's other micronutrients that play an influence in bone density. And so I want to talk about those as well as calcium. So some of the things to look at, so when we talk about minerals, you know, calcium, magnesium, you know, are some of the, you know, main minerals that we talked about for bone density, but, you know, zinc, you know, falls in that mineral category, important in collagen, you know, collagens as part of that bone architecture, um, you know, vitamins, so vitamin D, you know, improves how we absorb calcium from our digestive tract. It also has some influence on how these osteoblasts are laying down bone, vitamin K, you know, activate something um, called osteocalcin, uh, which increases, you know, the calcium in bone. Um, and then B6 and C uh, are important again in collagen production. Um, so uh, again, there's lots of different, you know, micronutrients that, uh, that are involved. And then um, protein, you know, protein is a macronutrient. But what we find uh, is a lot of uh, individuals as they, um, as they age, uh, they start to really decrease the protein intake in their diet. And that has been associated with loss of bone density and higher rates of fracture. So really making sure to get adequate protein um, to make sure that, uh, that uh, you, can, you don't uh, kind of put yourself at risk for this bone loss. <clears throat> so when we look at kind of whole food systems, it's really the kind of the the Mediterranean diet that has probably got the best data for bone health. Uh, people who followed this Mediterranean diet, you know, experience a 22% uh, reduction in fra uh, fracture risk uh, compared to those who kind of had more of a standard diet. So Mediterranean diet is, remember, you know, it's really kind of um, more whole food. So eating, you know, a lot of, you know, fruits and vegetables, uh, fatty fish, um, you know, limited kind of red meat, limited saturated, you know, animal fats, um, and more nuts, seeds, olive oil, uh, and that type of stuff. So that diet seemed to be kind of the preferred um, approach in terms of a dietary pattern. Um, and we talked about how protein, you know, also has to be part of this. You know, we want to look at somewhere between 0.8 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So again, if for that 150 pound individual, you know, that person weighs 68 kilograms. For that 68, if we're gonna get 0.8 grams of protein, uh, you know, per their 68 kilograms of body weight, um, we're gonna kind of try to focus somewhere on getting at least 54 grams of protein daily, you know, so up to, you know, almost double that, um, you know, it would be kind of that, um, that window that we'd like to see for protein intake. There are really some standout foods or superfoods for bone health. Um, I would say, you know, dark leafy greens, um, you know, can be a great uh, food for bone health. You know, they have great sorts of calcium and also this vitamin K that we talked about. So like bok choy, Chinese cab, kale, collard greens, um, we look at sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes have a lot of this magnesium as their minerals in there, and also potassium. You know, potassium, um, you know, plays a role um, in kind of uh, uh, fighting against some of the acidity of kind of our, of our foods and decreases kind of loss um, of uh, calcium. You know, in our urine. Um, I think when some of the dried fruits really are also 
things to look at. So figs and prunes. Um, there was one study on prunes where people ate five prunes a day. Um, after six months, they saw that their bones, uh, they had decreased um, kind of turnover of bones or so better stabilization kind of, of their bone health, which is with eating five prunes a day. Um, so that's figs um, also are another kind of dried fruit that are kind of high sources of calcium. Um, they provide a nice um, plant-based source of calcium for individuals. Um, salmon, um, three ounces of salmon is a, has, gives you a big boost of calcium, 187 milligrams of calcium from three ounces of salmon. And then some of our nuts, you know, um, like almonds, you know, are a great source. Uh, all, you know, two tables of almond butter, 111 milligrams of calcium. Tofu, um, so kind of this calcium rich tofu can have, you know, really high to half a cup, 860 milligrams of calcium, as well as having some of these other um, uh, chemical compounds called isoflavones, which have been associated with better bone health. And then kind of in the dairy category, you know, looking at yogurt, um, 187 grams of calcium per cup of yogurt. So these are some great foods for bone health. Um, you know, I think when we think about food and bone density, um, bone health, you know, there's a lot about dairy, you know, and kind of that cancer patient, I'm a little cautious on dairy. Um, I know it is a great source of calcium, but there have been some studies that, you know, are suggesting that um, high amounts of, of kind of um, dairy milk um, might increase uh, both pre and post menopausal breast cancer rates and also high kind of calcium diets um, you know, increase a man's risk of prostate cancer. So I'm a little cautious on dairy, especially, you know, milk. We didn't really see yogurt and cheese um, having that risk uh, for cancer. So that might be kind of the dairy to kind of look at when you're looking at kind of dietary sources of these nutrients. Um, in general, for my cancer patients, I say, you know, try to, you know, have no more than one to two servings of dairy a day and choose kind of more from that yogurt cheese category um, than from than from um, milk itself and look to use kind of in more plant-based uh, milks you know um, you know almond milk oat milk you know those type of can be kind of uh, non-dairy alternatives um, a lot of those are also fortified with calcium so it can be a good source of calcium I'm going to look at what, you know, is something that we'd want to avoid, especially if um, you have issues with kind of some uh, loss of bone density, you know, caffeine, um, just high amounts of caffeine. So, um, you know, they've shown that postmenopausal women who drank more than two cups of coffee had more bone loss of the spine. Um, so, again, kind of limiting, you know, again, kind of keeping it in to kind of more of a moderate range of, uh, of caffeine intake. Carbonated beverages also uh, had some association with um, increased risk of, of hip fracture. Um, so, you know, anything above two cans of soda a day, both caffeinated uh, and, and decaffeinated um, sodas uh, had that risk. Um, heavy alcohol intake. So having more than three or more drinks a day um, was associated with higher risk of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women and just eating a lot of salt in your diet. Uh, high salt diets aren't healthy for us for a number of reasons, but they also uh, increase um, our loss of calcium in our urine. Um, so what are the supplements to look at, you know, for bone health? Um, you know, sometimes we may think about um, getting calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, magnesium, collagen and these isoflavones might be things to think about um, if um, you know you have already um, some significant bone loss um, you know looking at healthy diet is always being kind of the the first step in kind of addressing health uh, but sometimes looking at at uh, supplementing with some of the dietary supplements so calcium is obviously the one that is recommended most um, you know sometimes there's some confusion about how much what what type um, as I said, there's lots of different uh, dietary sources, you know, of uh, calcium. When we'd say how much, you know, general the recommendation is a thousand to fifteen hundred milligrams daily, in both food and supplements. So remember that that's an important piece that your intake should include food and supplements. And you could do kind of a quick survey of how much calcium you're getting in your diet just from. Um, you know, again, going on, you know, um, you know, in just Googling, you know, your diet, you can say, you know, how much calcium in each kind of food you ate, um, you know, that can be a way to kind of just do, you know, a quick um, measure of how much you think you're getting. Um, 
you know, in your day. Um, in general, most people, um, you know, get at least 800 milligrams of calcium just from food alone. So if the recommendation is 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, then you would want to look in the supplementation rate as somewhere between 200 to 700 milligrams of calcium. Calcium is one of those things where we think more isn't better. Um, you know, there's some there's um, recommendations that you should really not go over a total of 2000 milligrams of calcium a day. Again, food plus supplements is when I'm talking these type of numbers, um, that these higher doses of calcium increase your risk of kidney stones. And then there's some um, association that they might increase risk of kind of developing plaque in your arteries or heart attacks or, or such. So, so too much is, is, um, is not um, kind of better. So again, sometimes people they hear that their, their bones, you know, they either have osteoporosis or osteopenia and they wanna do everything to strengthen their bones. And so sometimes they come in and they're telling me they're taking very high doses of calcium. Um, again, I think your body needs enough of the building blocks to make, you know, some healthy bone, but you kind of overdoing it isn't going to change bone mineralization. And that's really what our studies are um, are showing so you know what form um, I generally recommend calcium citrate um, you can take that with or without food or calcium carbonate a lot of individuals really need to have some food and that they have to have good stomach acid to absorb it so a lot of people who are on some of these acid blockers like these proton pump inhibitors um, you know or even um, you know things like Pepsid and these type of things could decrease um, their ability to kind of absorb calcium in, um, in the carbonate form. So I usually say calcium citr citrate is what um, we like to do. Um, you know, you can't, you know, if you're taking a thousand milligrams of calcium, you cannot take it all at once. You're not going to absorb a thousand milligrams kind of in one serving. You would have to divide it up. It really is shown that about 500, maybe 600 max um, is all we're going to, milligrams is all we're going to absorb kind of per serving. So we would divide it up if you're taking more than that into a morning and an evening dose. Um, Magnesium is that other mineral, second most abundant mineral in the body. Um, it's been shown that a lot of Americans um, are not getting enough in their diet. Um, you know, food sources, nuts, whole grains, dark vegetables, um, you know, fish, meat, and beans. Um, and it's been shown that people who have low kind of levels of magnesium, um, you know, also have lower bone density. So, you know, we feel that it really plays a role also in bone health um, and it's involved in more than 300 functions in the human body. Um, sometimes, you know, magnesium supplementation will be used for some different health conditions like insomnia, headaches, restless legs, anxiety. Um, you know, sometimes there's some benefit in adding um, some magnesium supplementation for those. But it, again, we use it for bones as well. Usually, you know, we're going to use magnesium glycinate or gluconate. Um, they're a little bit more absorbable. Um, they usually don't cause much of a, of a laxative effect. For people who um, are more constipators, I tend to then give them magnesium citrate. It helps with regularity of their bowels for them, as well as giving them a magnesium source. Usually, I'm you know going to recommend somewhere between 250 milligrams to 400 milligrams a day. Um, you know, in a supplement, usually have patients take that in the evening at bedtime. Vitamin D, you know, again, you know, one of the other kind of basic um, you know vitamins that we associate for for bone health. It's that sunshine vitamin. It means it's produced in our skin. When sunlight hits our skin, you know, it has to be skin that's you know uh, not covered by clothing, not uh, no sunscreen on. Um, with that, um, our skin can then synthesize this vitamin D. Um, but you know, as we age, our skin is not as efficient, so sometimes our vitamin D levels drop with aging. Uh, even if we are getting that sun exposure, I still say that so many of my patients, um, that when we check their vitamin D level here in sunny Arizona, we're still still seeing that they're vitamin D deficient. You know, it obviously plays a role in bone health, but we see some risk in kind of cancer. Um, uh, when patients have low uh, vitamin D levels or risk of cancer, cancer recurrence can be higher, risk of inflammation is higher. Um, so, you know, we, uh, it can have a, a number of health benefits in our cancer survivors as well as bone health. Um, dietary sources, again, generally this is one that we're going to be making, you know, in our skin, but there's very few foods that have them in naturally fish and 
fish oils um, can provide some vitamin D and then obviously there's some fortified foods like milk um, a lot of times uh, has been fortified with vitamin D so they're so meaning they add some vitamin D to that milk to increase um, the public uh, um, levels of, uh, of vitamin D in their diet um, uh, really you know when we look at how to supplement D3, vitamin D3 is generally has been shown to have a greater impact on bone density than D2. So that's generally, a, which is the over-the-counter version that's available as a supplement. The RDA for um, D is actually quite low, 400 IUs, international units a day. But a lot of experts are feeling this is too low and there's a lot of controversy on how much vitamin D to give. Um, I'm generally saying for most individuals, you're gonna give a thousand or 2000 IUs a day, um, but ideally you're gonna get your vitamin D level checked and you're gonna try to get your level somewhere between 40 and 70. Um, that's really what I target for my patients. Um, so if you can get your vitamin D level checked, uh, especially if you have you know, some bone loss issues, um, you know, that's a good way to make sure that you're getting adequate amounts of D for you because we all absorb it differently, utilize it differently. So there can't be one standard recommendation for everybody. Vitamin K, you know, is that other supplement that uh, is getting some interest uh, for bone health. It's another fat soluble vitamin, A, D, E, and K are your fat solubles. Um, it's been shown that people who have low intake in their diet, so less than 109 micrograms a day, had an increased risk of hip fractures and low bone density. So it is an important nutrient for bone health. You get it in dark green vegetables, olive oil, soybean oil, um, there's different forms, you know, vitamin K1 and K2. K2 comes in MK4 and MK7 when you look at the shelves and of, you know, kind of in the stores. K2 has probably the most evidence, um, you know, in studies as a supplement for bone density. Um, you have to be careful if you're on blood thinners. Uh, you may have to avoid, you know, vitamin K supplementation. So you definitely would want to check with um, your uh, physician if you are on a blood thinner. Um, Usually, you know, we're going to dose it for the studies um, uh, on osteoporosis, you know, have shown some benefit using K2 somewhere in that 45 to 180 micrograms a day. Collagen is another interesting hot topic out there. Um, there's some limited data that collagen may improve bone density. Collagen is something that makes up 95 percent, you know, of our bone. Um, and uh, type one collagen, 95% of the collagen or bone is type one. Um, we can get some uh, collagen from things like fish and shellfish and egg whites, chicken. These are kind of sources of collagen. Um, the studies that looked at using about five grams of these collagen peptides a day, uh, showing that some increased bone density um, of the hip and spine and that um, these uh, these blood tests or these urine tests that we uh, do to kind of measure how how fast the uh, bone is turning over, uh, we see that the you know, we lower bone turnover rates, um, so less bone is being broken down for people who are taking five grams a day of these collagen peptides. So it may be something to consider or look at those dietary sources. The other area is these isoflavones. These are um, you know chemical compounds that we find in beans, especially soybeans. Um, Iperflavone is a, um, a synthetic um, flavone that um, is made into a supplement. Um, there has been some studies uh, um, demonstrating some benefit of using about 200 milligrams a day of iperflavone to uh, improve bone density in elderly women with osteoporosis. Um, these women had to have adequate calcium intake to really uh, demonstrate, you know, the, the full benefit of taking this supplement, which is the same thing with, you know, a lot of these things like vitamin D, vitamin K. You have to have a good amount of mineral in order to be able to um, direct, you know, your bone to lay down, you know, bone minerals. So you got to get enough in, in your diet um, to be able to um, have that function uh, work properly. And then the other kind of topic I would say in on bone health is strontium. I see so many of my patients coming in um, using a bone supplement that has strontium in it. Some of them guaranteeing that they're going to improve their bone density with this product. Well, strontium, you know, has a lot of concerns. Um, it is the heavy metal, just like lead and mercury are heavy metals. Heavy metals um, get deposited in bone. Heavy metals make your bones light up. Um, so they really kind of make your bone density actually look 
you know, better than it really is. Um, the strontia has been shown to kind of replace uh, calcium in the bone. So instead of kind of putting, um, you know, uh, calcium on that bone scaffolding, you're putting strontium. Um, you know, it had been um, looked at a lot in Europe as a treatment for osteoporosis and a form that was available over in um, Europe, strontium ranolate, um, had shown some benefit. Um, and so that's really where a lot of interest uh, kind of took off. Uh, here in the U.S., that is not available um, in an available form of strontium. We generally see strontium citrate as the uh, strontium that's used in a lot of these supplements. There really um, are not any good studies looking at human health using strontium citrate. Um, and in Europe, um, they really started to see that people using strontium had increased risks of heart attacks and blood clots. And so they really kind of revoked the recommendation of using it as a treatment. So again, I'm just really not um, a fan of incorporating strontium. I think that it has some significant health concerns. So I wouldn't recommend a supplement. So again, sometimes people are very excited because their bone density looks better after using a strontium product. But again, I think that when in terms of a healthy bone, uh, you know, I really um, don't have any good confidence that that's what's happening uh, with that improvement in that bone density score. So just kind of in summary, kind of a prescription for bone health, we really want to, uh, from a lifestyle perspective, we really want to look at, you know, the diet, you know, Mediterranean diet is going to be preferred just for even cancer survivorship and now bone health. Um, and really kind of think about incorporating some of these superfoods, you know, um, you know, like prunes, you know, five prunes a day, um, you know, maybe all it takes to really kind of improve bone density and leafy greens really are, are considered a superfood in so many different um, uh, areas of health and so especially for bone so i would really think about kind of pulling some of these superfoods in um, you know to your diet you know movement is so important so exercise you know it doesn't really take a lot you know of exercise each week to be able to impact bone health uh, so try to get that two to three times a, uh, a week of some type of um, of uh, weight-bearing exercise and then if you do have you know some osteopenia osteoporosis or in that high risk category then maybe look at some of these uh, supplements definitely calcium and vitamin d but again maybe looking at things you know like magnesium and vitamin k um, you know iproflavones and, and collagen as you know other things to impact bone health so that's all i have today on bone health um, i hope you found uh, this topic helpful um, we have a lot of different uh, these health topics um, on our YouTube channel, so I hope uh, you will take a look at our library uh, that we have on YouTube for you. Um, and then again, you know, weekly we offer uh, on Tuesdays um, our Lunch and Learn series uh, where we try to provide content uh, um, for you that uh, hopefully will be useful for you in um, optimizing your health. So thank you for joining me. Um, have a great day. Thank you for joining us for our virtual Lunch and Learn series. We hope you enjoyed this session. There will be a replay of this Lunch and Learn on the Ironwood YouTube and social media channels. For more information regarding our supportive care services, classes, and events, email us at wellness at ironwoodcrc.com. Thank you for spending time with us today.